Okay, I would say let's get started. If anybody comes late, um, then they will have to take a look at the recording uh, for whatever they missed at the beginning, but I don't want to keep you guys waiting just because anybody else um, didn't make it on time. Uh, so as tested already, um, uh, we um, encourage you to use the chat box throughout the meeting to uh, raise any questions also. Uh, my colleague Carsten Dittering, he's uh, with me on the phone here, although sitting on a different continent in Seattle, Washington, actually. Uh, he will be my helping hand um, handling the chat box and uh, then um, I can concentrate on the uh, presentation and uh, he will um, bring up any questions uh, that might be of interest for the general audience. So without any further ado, I would say uh, we get started with this webinar. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, the focus of today's meeting is um, streamlining uh, certain processes in, um, in the early drug discovery. And uh, for, the, uh, for this purpose, we are going to explore uh, how to use the NIME workflow environment um, to achieve this. Um, So, streamlining your drug discovery process. Um, this is my entry slide. Just to give you an overview, um, on this slide, which is a bit outdated by now, uh, you already see that we have quite a few different software tools uh, available for different tasks in the drug discovery process. Yeah? We have certain tools on the uh, structure-based site, um, height for affinity assessment, deleted suite for uh, docking, essentially, and um, we also have on the ligand-based side uh, tools available. Uh, one uh, very prominent tool is feature trees. Uh, that is a 2D similarity descriptor for very rapid similarity screening uh, and flex s um, is a uh, tool for 3d alignment uh, so also a similarity method um, uh, this one uh, rapid in 2d world and this um, yeah, very accurate in 3d world and uh, we also have some fragment-based design tools, various interfaces to the outside world. Uh, I'm going to touch upon a number of these tools later on today in the context of NIME workflows. Yeah? Because as you can imagine, every single tool has its own interface and um, yeah, uh, a certain learning curve attached to uh, its use uh, and um, NIME gives you a, a unique interface essentially to all these different tools so we find it very convenient to couple multiple tools uh, together um, uh, in order to have certain very useful processes uh, at work for you. Okay, feature trees, uh, and the provocative title is virtual chemistry, uh, going way beyond uh, what's going on in the wet lab, even beyond what is you know, usually uh, covered uh, as uh, know-how in the medicinal chemistry world, but really reaching out further uh, in an exploratory way um, covering all virtual chem chemistry and covering all those molecules that could, in principle, be made. Yeah? 
uh, and this is where we want to reach out and uh, want to uh, be able to discover new IP. Um, here is an, another overview slide of how this uh, feature tree search works in principle. Um, uh, the idea is the medicinal chemistry knowledge not only in terms of particular molecules but actually in terms of different reaction schemes that uh, all lead to libraries of molecules. And usually uh, one way or another these uh, reaction protocols or molecule libraries are combinatorial by nature so they will apply to various reagents leading to multiple products and if you would enumerate all these products uh, actually I hope you can see my mouse pointer moving uh, Carsten maybe you can give me a quick feedback otherwise I can stop waving the mouse pointer if nobody sees I, um, I can see you I can see your mouse pointer, but if you, you hear me? Say that again, please. Um, ich, ich hör dich. I can hear you. Um, you can use a control and then the left mouse button to have the laser pointer. So if you type control on the keyboard and press the left mouse button after that, you'll get a laser pointer for this, uh, for the little mouse pointer. Okay. Um, anyway. So, all these libraries, and you can think of many, of course, here, uh, encode uh, multiple products, uh, and in total, you easily uh, arrive at not only millions, but even, you know, magnitudes larger, so trillions of virtual compounds in a chemical space, yeah? And our feature tree, methodology is able to search in such a chemistry space. The idea is to take a query molecule. So this is your whatever, natural substrate, the competitor compound, something uh, uh, another academic lab has published, uh, you name it, your hypothesis if you want. And now you want to retrieve from that chemical space molecules that are similar to the query um, among these trillions, yeah? And you can do that, do the search with the query and retrieve similar molecules to the query. Uh, similar, as, I, as I'm going to explain in the context of feature tree similarity. Um, and as an added value, not only do you get the molecule, but you even get the identification of the library that this molecule comes from. Yeah. So this matches back to your MedChem know-how in the input. So not only do you get the virtual product, but also the recipe, essentially, how to make that molecule. Um, and um, uh, on this slide, I'm going to show you how we further elaborate on that, yeah. So again, the basic idea: we do a feature tree search in the virtual chemistry space. As you are going to see, it takes a few minutes at most to search in a really large space uh, and retrieve, say, uh, in the thousands of uh, virtual hits as a validation in 3D. We overlay the molecules, so the next step is to narrow down from thousands of virtual hits to say in the hundreds of hits uh, using a 3D shape filter. If you are in the lucky situation um, uh, that you have a 3D structure, you can even use that and now dock all these virtual hits uh, into the active site and narrow it further down, at the end it will be uh, uh, up to you and your visual inspection and your choice 
as to which libraries and which cores to focus on and either purchase molecules or use these recipes and go ahead and um, have the chemists make those molecules. Yeah. And as you can see here now, um, first step, uh, as I described, is a feature tree similarity search. Next step is a 3D similarity. Next step is a docking. So already in this um, approach, you see that we need multiple different tools to accomplish the overall ta task, which is from a query molecule arrive at um, uh, a selection of compounds for either purchase or chemistry. And um, how this works, I'm going to show you now in a live demo. Okay, um, this is my ligand-based drug discovery demo workflow, and um, I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Eliminate a few lines here that may be irritating at the beginning, and let us at the very beginning focus on this part of the workflow. That is. Um, simply using feature trees to calculate, uh, calculate the similarity between a query molecule and a small library of other molecules that we want to compare to. And um, at this point, I should indicate uh, that uh, I know for some of you this will be uh, already a jump start into the NIME environment. Um, in this uh, webinar, I'm not going to show you the, um, yeah, how to get started in NIME. A little while ago, um, we did another webinar, which was focused on, you know, on the, the very beginner steps of NIME. And in order to refresh my memory, I looked at that older recording and I just bring it here to the forefront. Here in this other webinar, we showed how to install the software, how to make use of our website to download it, you know, what has to be specified in the preferences and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, you can still Watch that recording and in that webinar you are going to see all the very, very basic steps. So if anybody um, yeah, today um, has questions to that very beginning of the first steps of using our software altogether in NIME, um, I will not only put the recording of today's webinar online for you to look at, but also the recording of the old webinar. Yeah? So for starters, look at the old one first, whatever you may skip passages, um, but focus on the very basics, and uh, then you can revisit uh, what we are going to discuss today. And today I just expect that our software is already installed in your NIME environment. And um, I have here uh, the feature tree component. And uh, I can show you that uh, if I do that and run that reader, you know, I have my library molecules. A right click shows me, OK, I have some molecules here loaded. In the table, you always see the yellow light, yellow traffic light for this is good to go to the next step. So you can execute the calculation of the feature tree similarities. You see that has been very fast. Um, and if I look at the results table, not only do I have the molecule, but now I also have a similarity. 
uh, associated to it. Um, right. Now, um, expanding beyond that, um, I want to show you uh, how to visualize uh, the feature tree um, similarity actually in 2D depictions. Uh, I first execute a row filter, giving me only the molecules with a pretty high feature tree similarity. Anything greater than 0.8 is going to be considered. If I execute that, I have a little shorter a table, and now I can plug this into another feature tree node, which gives me 2D mappings, as it's called. I also plug in the query um, molecule again into this node. So the query that we used for the similarity searching first is used again in the calculation of the feature tree 2D mappings. I can execute that. <clears throat> And now we make use of one of the uh, biosolvite uh, nodes, which is an interactive table view. I execute and open that as a view. And now you see my table has expanded further a little bit. Now we not only have the similarities and the molecules that we read in, but we also have this picture, these pictures. And if you double click on a picture like that, it enlarges. And now you have a full view in 2D uh, of the feature tree mapping. Uh, the feature tree mapping is given uh, color coded here, uh, meaning that uh, um, when the color is in agreement, that part of the molecule matches onto the other one. Yeah? And as these molecules are fairly similar, yeah, the mapping here is uh, fairly clear. Red over green over blue over orange here to this ring. And then that gray part is not mapped on anything because there isn't anything on the other molecule. It is in this not matched session, a section. Yeah. Overall, this gives you a similarity of 0.8. And if I now uh, use the similarity column, do a right click and sort in a, uh, in a descending order, I have my self match the molecule onto itself with similarity 1.0 on um, rank number one in the table, and then with decreasing similarity, uh, the other molecules from the set. I should say that all these molecules are binders uh, of the same protein. So not surprisingly, these molecules all, are all fairly similar. Again, if you double click on any of the pictograms, uh, you get it enlarged. And uh, you can inspect visually how feature trees maps the different parts of the molecules onto each other. Um, the mapping has a local similarity value and uh, the average of the local similarity values normalized with a overall similarity value. Any questions so far? Um, you look at the chat here. There was one question: um, what what type of or when we should um, uh, basically modify the parameters for the calculation? Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, is it convenient to modify the parameters used? Um, how do we do that? Uh, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, um, all of the nodes. If you right click on them, they have a configure functionality that is basically um, giving you all the settings 
that are possible with the feature tree similarity. Uh, it is fairly minimal. Um, you can only provide a similarity threshold. Um, so any molecule that is below the threshold won't even be um, put on the output port uh, of the node. Um, and uh, you have different choices of um, how this should apply if you have multiple molecules um, as query molecules in the input. Uh, the default parameter is strict, so all columns then must be above the threshold, but you can also have a softer criterion, which is just one of the query molecules must give you a similarity above the threshold. Um, so that is the few parameters that you have for this node. And um, if we have enough time, uh, later, uh, I can show you the settings also for the docking software uh, or the height uh, uh, affinity assessment uh, where there are more settings. In any case, uh, all the parameters that we found useful for the user to modify, we put in this, um, in this dialog called uh, configuration or configure dialog of the node. And uh, for the really hardcore um, programmers among you, uh, underneath the implementation of the node, we use a scripting language. Uh, and here, um, as it says, you can customize the feature tree similarity calculation um, according to your needs and in what level of detail um, you feel comfortable with. But you see here in the warning, the script works fine without touching it. Do not modify it unless you know exactly what you're doing. So this is really for the programmers among you. Okay. Yeah, um, one note that I just uh, saw uh, as an indication, I should stress that um, there is my table. Um, the similarity ranges from zero to one. So mm -hmm. if I sort uh, in a descending order, you see identical means similarity value one and Decreasing similarity, uh, this is still very high the similarity value, but it goes as low as zero, so which means total disagreement. See, see, see. Is, is there a question or is that just noise on the line? I uh, <coughs> haven't muted everyone, so uh, I. Okay. I, I just did that and uh, we can keep the questions for, for later. Okay. Again, for the late arrivals, mute yourself or we are going to mute you in order to reduce the noise on the line. And uh, if you have any questions, type it into the, uh, the chat box. Okay. So this was uh, feature trees mapping in 2D. But on my slide, I also showed you uh, that you can follow this up in 3D. Uh, and this is what we are going to do next. Uh, in order to achieve that, I'm going to rewire the workflow a, a bit and now take the query again here uh, as an input to the feature tree alignment in 3D. I take the output here as the library input part for this node and again, uh, we have a configuration here, a few, few more parameters uh, in this one. We just use the defaults and execute it. Uh, I, I need to select in the configuration which input I want to use. 
I want to use the theory molecule. Ah, there is no other choice. Why? Okay. Execute. <clears throat> so now, following the feature tree similarity calculation, we also do a 3D overlay of the molecules. Uh, that takes a, a little bit longer. And uh, then we have another node here, which is a 3D interactive cure. Christian, uh, if I quickly may add to that, um, there was a question on what we actually try to achieve with F trees. If we just find to uh, try to find similar analogs, and F trees is really actually a scaffold hopping tool. And uh, depending on the molecules that you are searching, so how how similar they are, how how diverse they are, you can control the cutoff where you where you basically move into the scaffold hopping regime with this uh, threshold that Christian was just talking about. So what you really try to achieve is find a molecule that has the exact same uh, or very, very similar physical chemical properties, but a different scaffold. Right. Uh, again, apologies to everybody uh, for uh, jumping right into the middle here um, in terms of um, yeah, required know-how. Um, also, I didn't talk much about the feature tree method in itself. That as well is covered in the previous uh, webinar um, to a great uh, extent and detail. Again, I'm going to put this older webinar online as well. Yeah, so for anybody who is lost here a bit in terms of yeah, feature tree similarity, how is it calculated and stuff, that is explained there. Um, uh, Carsten already said it, uh, feature trees is a similarity method. It works in 2D world. Uh, we extended that uh, to generate also 3D overlays. And the main benefit of feature trees is finding similar molecules um, that um, may differ quite a bit in terms of chemical structure. So it's very suitable of um, finding, quote unquote, remotely similar molecules. So molecules that have similar features in a similar position, um, but have a different chemical structure. So uh, our um, customer base finds this method particularly useful to do scaffold hopping experiments. There was one more question. Uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate on the 3D alignment search if it uh, searches among different conformers or if it's static. Yeah. So the starting point um, of the 3D search is one conformer um, of the molecule, um, but it can be any conformer. And uh, the node in Excel will do a conformational expansion, so enumerate conformers, and then use the feature tree mapping, what you just uh, saw in 2D, uh, in the depictions, as a guideline to align the molecules, or these conformers now, in 3D. Yeah? So we do the conformational uh, expansion ourselves, and um, all we need is a, a starting confirmation in 3D. Um, but here in the methods repository, you already see that um, uh, we also have a 3D coordinate generation available uh, for you. Yeah? So that is one of the methods at your disposal. Okay. I hope that answers the question. And all I wanted to show here now is that um, you know, uh, how uh, the different overlays of the molecules look like. I already said these are all active compounds uh, for the same target, so they are not so very different uh, from each other. So the um, 3D overlay is fairly obvious. Okay, so this way we calculate a P 
pure 2D similarity value. We can use that for filtering and that's about it. We can also look at the 2D mappings as, as these color-coded graphs. And we can also take it into 3D world um, and then look at the overlays um, and check whether or not in 3D that feature trees mapping also made sense. No? But originally I started with a search, and I bring up the slide again, that goes way beyond that and goes into this virtual chemistry regime where we want to search millions or trillions of compounds from these chemical reactions. And I just quickly wanted to show you that this is also very simple. Um, and another extension of the feature tree method is uh, called feature tree fragment spaces. And um, the only difference between the feature tree, uh, the plain feature tree method and the feature tree fragment space method is that they take different inputs. Both need a query molecule, but one needs, needs a library of small molecules as an input, um, enumerated molecules, complete molecules, and the other one needs a so-called fragment space as the input. Uh, the fragment space is what covers you know, these multiple reactions. And for a tryout, we um, provide a fragment space. It's called the knowledge space. Uh, and again, you can find the details in our documentation. That is a um, virtual space covering some 82 um, chemical libraries uh, of, um, of interest to medicinal chemists uh, and these 82 libraries uh, generate you know, on the order of um, uh, 1.2 billion virtual molecules and uh, with this feature tree fragment space search we will reset here and execute it while I speak. It takes a minute or so to search in this library um, for Richard, virtual products. There was a question uh, where the library resides, where where and how it is installed, and uh -huh. if the customer has to install it uh, himself or herself. Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Again, I open the configure dialog, and uh, all this reader node here takes as an input is a zip file um, uh, containing the, the fragment space. In your file browser, you specify the location of the zip file. And indeed, you have to um, download that zip file um, uh, separately. I'm going to show you here by SRIT. Resources, download under, under feature trees. You have these different download options, and under additional material for feature trees, uh, you find the knowledge space. And as you can see, uh, this is the zip file. Uh, you just store it somewhere on your machine, and then um, uh, locate that using the file browser here, and that's all that's needed for the reader node. Um, and uh, once that gets the green light, you can do the similarity search. Um, that is way finished by now. And again, I can look in the interactive table what kinds of results we get. And this is how it looks like. You have your query molecule, of course, the same all the time. And then you have your hit molecule and an associated similarity value. But as I promised, 
beyond uh, only a virtual product, you also get um, the name of the reaction and the name of the reagents leading to that virtual product. So that is essentially for your chemists, the recipe of how to make the molecule yeah, and which reagents to use. And uh, again, this result list, you could stick now into any of the nodes above, for example, the 2D mapping calculation and or the 3D alignment method. Um, since the result of the feature pre search, uh, I'll open that quickly here as well, is a smiles string, so that is without any 3D coordinates. I use here a 3D coordinate generator, or I must use a 3D coordinate generator, uh, convert things to 3D. And now I can stick in principle uh, that into this node here on top and uh, generate also a 3D alignment. But that is something uh, that you can explore for yourself. Uh, in the download area, uh, after this meeting, I will um, uh, save both the workflows that I show, the ligand-based design, and the structure-based design demo workflow together with all the data that you need. Yeah. Okay. So that is similarity searching, starting from a huge virtual space, uh, covering 2D mapping, covering 3D alignment, um, browsing through through results. And of course, you can use that now in combination with any of the other useful nodes uh, that you find in NIME to explore your data further. And if there are no more questions at this point, uh, then I would um, take the next step and look at the structure-based side. I see here another question. Do we install it ourselves? Um, if you can explain a bit further what, what it uh, is that needs to be installed. I think the question refers to if, if, the, if, if it comes with the, with the MIME node already sort of incorporated or if it has to be installed afterwards. I think that's what the question is. Okay, so this was the question about the virtual chemistry space. About the library, yes. Yeah, it is not part of the workflow. Um, and yes, you will need to uh, download um, and uh, download the space yourself. And as I showed you here in the configuration, you need to point the fragment space reader to the location of where you stored it. Okay, uh, so then I can continue with uh, my presentation. Um, I didn't touch on this part so far, the 3D um, alignment, um, but that comes now uh, after we finished the ligand-based design demo. So looking at the structure-based design um, side, uh, we have multiple tools again at our disposal. And again, I'm not going to talk too much about the tools. They are documented in great detail in numerous pro publications and presentations also. If you have any questions beyond that, afterwards, yeah, feel free to ask us. Um, so just the, um, uh, the, the basic idea, uh, what is Recall about? The title says Google like rescaffolding. So the idea is with Recall, just uh, change the mouse pointer again. So, Christian, try this control and then left mouse button. Yeah, I know, Carsten. 
Um, okay. the, um, you mark a part of the molecule uh, that is uh, uh, that should be replaced. We uh, call that the cuts. You carve out or cut out part of the molecule, and then uh, you oops, then you seek for a you seek for a replacement. And the target function here is you um, want to leave those marked bonds as precisely as possible in their position and search through a fragment library, a 3D fragment library for replacement fragments that achieve that. Leave the bonds in place but give you a totally different um, uh, structure in the middle ground. Yeah. And um, again, I'm going to show you that live. Uh, but this, uh, first, I want to uh, just highlight uh, that the second tool in the structure based design suite is the Flex X docking tool. Um, many of you will have heard about it. Um, over the years, we have uh, optimized. Uh, the implementation um, to a great deal. We now uh, achieve uh, a redocking accuracy of 93%. So 93% um, of the cases in the Aztec data set can be redocked below two angstroms, so with reasonable accuracy. And uh, even uh, three quarters can be redocked with high accuracy under one angstrom. Um, there was a big docking and scoring competition at one of the last uh, ACS meetings. And you can see here with these box plots um, that um, FlexX uh, compares favorably to the other programs. They all have their best case targets and their worst targets. So all of the program's uh, performances depend very much still on what kind of target you are working on. Everyone has their strengths and their weaknesses, um, but uh, overall FlexX does very well in this high ranking competition. Um, and the third tool in the team of three uh, is the height uh, scoring function. Again, I have just one picture highlighting its main feature, which is um, that height not only gives you an affinity uh, prediction or an affinity correlated score, uh, but it also is able to break down the score into so-called atom contributions. And you can look at various scenarios so here you have an acceptor sitting opposite to another acceptor. Uh, that is a very unfavorable situation and uh, rightfully so Hyde penalizes this situation with a drastic uh, so-called desolvation cost of 10.6 kilojoule per mole. Whereas on the other hand side, buried hydrophobic surface, everybody knows this is the driving force for binding affinity. So burying here a carbon atom in an aromatic uh, or in a, in a hydrophobic environment gives you a favorable increment of the score. And last but not least, you have this mixed scenario where uh, you have polar atoms uh, forming a hydrogen bond. Again, you pay a penalty for desolvating uh, these atoms, but you overcompensate that by forming the hydrogen bond, giving you a small but also a favorable increment of the score. So that is, in a nutshell, one of the main advantages of the height scoring function, um, uh, giving you a breakdown in terms of atom contributions to a score. And again, uh, I want to rather show you that in a live demo. Um, 
for that benefit I have prepared for you a structure-based design demo workflow. Here I'm going to show you how to prepare things, uh, essentially the protein in our lead IT package. And then we do successively recore, docking, high definity prediction, and then we look at the results. So let's get started. Um, we reset the node, execute it. <clears throat> oh, no, excuse me. Step. I need to configure it and uh, uh, and uh, as a fresh start, I want to create a new project. So that opens the lead IT software um, and leads me directly to the so-called receptor preparation dialog. Um, here I load a PDB file either directly from the server or from file. Uh, again, this is the data that I'm going to send over to you so you can try that out for yourself uh, after the webinar. So that is script evident uh, with biotin bound to it and, um, and you can see here it's a fairly small protein uh, and step by step I uh, follow the green arrow here to do uh, the definition of uh, the so-called receptor on the basis of the PDB input. Uh, an essential step is defining the binding site. The default is if there is a bound ligand, we use that as a reference and carve out 6.5 angstroms, that is this number here, around the small molecule atoms as the active site. We can leave it at that. Go to the next step which is the protonation step. So here now you see the protons have been assigned. Um, and this is a very um, clever algorithm uh, that is used to optimize the hydrogen bonding network. Uh, so the assignment of orientations of the protons and also uh, possible flips of a histidine, the protonation or the deprotonation of the acids and stuff like stuff like that. Stuff like that is all done automatically. But of course the user can overrule any of the choices. We have here all the amino acids that are part of the active site. You can visually inspect all the choices um, and also make your changes if you know better uh, then the default assignment from the protein. Uh, you also see here water molecules covered and also if needed changes to the small molecule. Um, you can go to a great level of detail or as a beginner just trust the software um, at least to start with and just continue here uh, with the default which is usually a good choice to start with. Okay, we are done here. We have defined uh, the active site. Um, you can switch on the surface to have a better impression. I hope you can see that in the web software. Uh, but um, again, I don't have time to go through this in too much detail, so I'm going to leave lead IT. And as you can see here, my exit is the exit and return to NIME. If I do that, I'm asked if I want to save, save these changes. Yes, I want to do that. Okay. And now that I configured the node, I can execute the node. <clears throat> And that node now serves as the protein input for all the other nodes here. For the recall, 
for the docking, for the height affinity, even for the visualization. It's all based on the same protein data. Yeah? Let's now quickly move on to um, on to um, the recall node. It opens the same interface with a different widget. This time it's not the protein preparation widget, but instead it's the so-called recall widget. Yeah? Um, in recall, you uh, load a small molecule, you can use this shortcut here to load the bound ligand. You could also load a different molecule, but again, this is a reasonable starting point. Use the reference ligand. Okay, here, so here's my bound ligand. And now recall, again, I want to show you the picture uh, to remind you, carve out a part of the molecule and seek for replacement patterns. So that is what I'm going to do here. Uh, you may know this small molecule. It's a very tight binder, um, but you may or may not like um, the alkyl chain here uh, for whatever reason. So this is just uh, an example case, but still it serves the purpose. Uh, uh, I carve out a part of the molecule and hitting the recall button will give me with Google-like speed uh, different patterns for a replacement. Yeah? And I can run here through this table and look at the different variants of answers that the molecule, uh, that the program finds. Oops. We see here, wow, this is largely protruding into the active site. Well, this is no wonder since we haven't told the program to take the protein into account. I will quickly do that. It is under the advanced options here where you have a shape um, tab and can use the binding site atoms as excluded volumes. Uh, you see all these red spheres now. Every um, active site atom has an excluded volume around it. Uh, and I can close the visualization of the uh, red spheres so that I can have a better overview. If I now run Recall again, I get only much smaller uh, solutions back that fit into the active site without protruding into the protein. Yeah? So that is that. Again, you can visually inspect different solutions. Um, but again, I just wanted to show you not a full featured recall demo, but just uh, scratch on the surface of what in, in principle this software does. Again, I leave lead IT, exit and return to NIME, save the changes. Um, and now I have these 20 solutions that you just saw as recall solutions stored. And while I'm talking, I plug them in to the docking software. And now, um, the idea is well, these are virtually generated de novo scaffold hops. Now, yeah? uh, let's dock them and assess them with a different set of softwares and see if there's anything uh, reasonably high scoring in the mix. <clears throat> and um, this computation now takes a bit longer. It's uh, in the order of you know, 10 to 20 seconds per molecule. Um, but uh, I must remind you that this also runs on my laptop here. So uh, bear with me uh, since this is not 
the usual desktop machine with unlimited CPU power. Okay, while this is running, um, I can actually on the fly um, Uh, Christian, could you say how many um, how many solutions per ligand you keep in that particular example? Yeah, uh, maybe so right away. So this is about to be completed. I think I use the default settings. Again, configure shows me the parameters. And yeah, the default is 10 poses per molecule. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, we have 10 poses for each of the 20, 10 at most. Uh, and uh, indeed, we have 200 rows. If I look at the results table, now I have the pose and also the score associated um, to the pose. And uh, you can see here that we have a variety of poses and scores. I wanted to quickly use a filter here to shorten the demo a bit, a row filter. Um, so I want to use the column that is called total score, make um, uh, Minus minus one hundred and forty. The range of scores. Remember, this is affinity, so a minus attached to it. So I skim off the top of the list. Uh, that leaves me with uh, still fifty rows. Uh, let's quickly stick them into the height affinity assessment and. Um, that all will also take a bit of time. And um, while this is running, uh, I can already uh, show you my final slide here. Uh, I will still show you the results. Um, but um, while this is still running, again, thanks for joining this webinar. Actually, Carsten and I will stay a little longer. So if you have any remaining questions that you want to ask now, uh, stay, stick around for a while and uh, you get a chance to ask your question. Uh, Associated with the webinar, we have the special offer uh, to try out all the software for a full 12 months. Um, so extend your trial license for a full year. And um, again, don't hesitate to ask any questions, uh, be it right now after the meeting or um, with email uh, and personal communication afterwards. Okay, let me quickly check back. Uh, the affinity calculation has completed uh, as well. Um, I can execute the table view of these results. Now you see here that we have a height score. Uh, I sort in ascending order. We have very decent height scores of minus 55 here. Uh, and let's quickly check um, with the results. Viewer in 3D, again, just to show you uh, how this in principle looks like. Um, so here is your rudimentary 3D visualization. You can switch on the height coloring. Uh, so you get that red and green colors that I showed you on the, um, um, on the slides. And we do indeed here find a replacement pattern, which is a ring that snugly fits into this active site. So with a very uh, nice height score, or we find 
uh, a decent replacement. So essentially story completed and uh, task of scaffold replacement here successfully uh, accomplished. Okay, with that, I'm going to end the presentation and um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions now. Unmute yourself and go ahead.